Hey everyone, this is Ross and in today's video, we're gonna be doing something a bit different today. We're gonna be doing some consulting work and this is something that I offer you guys, believe it or not. We've been doing this for a while now and normally when I do some consulting work for you guys, I either drive out to your residence or maybe your location, your site, you know, give you guys some instruction, some advice, or I talk to you guys on the phone and have a nice little one-on-one -on -one conversation or maybe we even do this on Skype. Um, in a video chat, um, but recently I was contacted by two viewers and they actually wanted me to do this through email and they were really nice enough to let me use this consulting work um, to share it with you guys. So not only are they paying for this, but they're also allowing you guys to get the advice that they're getting. And I'm also nice enough to kind of share this advice with you guys as well because it's also sort of acts as a promotion for future consulting work. So if anyone out there is interested in getting some consulting work done, this is a nice little example of what you're gonna get. And if you're interested, just at the end of the video, check out our website, figboss.com. It's in the description of the video. Go to the consulting page here and you can see, you can kind of read about this. We're gonna add a little bit more to this because it's not just fig orchard consultation, but um, also if you wanna grow food in your backyard, whether that's vegetables, fruits, um, even houseplants, anything when it comes to growing something, I'm offering some consulting work. And this is a nice little contact form down here below. Fill this out and it'll send me a message. However, I think I'm gonna change this whole thing up a bit. We talked about this in the, the first consulting video that we did. Um, not just a couple days ago, I think, or maybe a week ago, depending on when this video gets gets published. But um, that's what we're doing today is we're going to go through somebody's orchard. Actually, what they had done through email was send me up as much information as they possibly could. They typed it up, send me all these photos. We're going to go through all of that, and then we're going to give them the advice that um, I think is the best available. So, all right, so let's get into this now. Um, Carl had reached out to me and he said, so just a little bit of background information here. I'm going to read this out to you guys. So this is where I'm at. I live in Ireland. I have a back garden and an allotment. I've been at the whole fig thing for two and a half years. He has a small orchard of mostly potted trees. The ultimate goal is to establish a productive, mature orchard and nursery so that I could possibly sell fresh figs and young trees. That's really awesome, Carl. Um, I want to do the same thing. Um, Additionally, uh, this is very different than the prior consulting video that we did where that whole video was all about backyard orchard culture. So this is very different. Uh, he says, I am, however, fully aware that this may not ever happen given the climatic region and the conditions that he's growing in. So realistically, what I'm attempting to do is trial growing methods and varieties to see if I can get any sort of consistent productivity in my area. Um, I've jotted down a number of points just to give you some info. Um, number one, climate and space. He lives in a very high latitude, 53, and his climatic zone is ocean temperate. Oceanic temperate. I'm in the same boat as you with regard to a short growing season. However, our summers are pretty cool with the hottest months hitting into the high teens and low 20s of Celsius, which is somewhere around 70, 70 degrees Fahrenheit with sporadic bursts of hot weather. We also get our fair share of rain here. Though I do have the advantage of having mild winters, which means I can plant trees in the ground without risk of dieback. I think we're classified as zone nine here, which is pretty awesome. So in short, Carl lives in Ireland, which is a very mild climate, mild in the wintertime, mild in the summertime. His latitude is very far north, meaning that he honestly just doesn't get the sunlight that I do. And if we look here at a latitude map, <clears throat> you can see that 45 is right here. I'm right in this location. So I'm even below 45. I think I'm around somewhere around 42, which is pretty, um, if you draw the line, you actually, I'm in the same latitude as something like Italy which you would consider to be a really warm climate. 
Um, it's only because of that Gulf Stream that comes up over the Gulf and goes up through Europe and the Mediterranean that really warms that whole area. Um, and, you know, Carl here, he's in, in Ireland, which is way north in the United Kingdom, 40, or I think he said 53 on the latitude, which is like equivalent to somewhere in like Canada, in, in northern Canada, which really doesn't bear, doesn't sound great when you think about it in terms of the amount of sunlight he gets. So that's really important to also consider here. Uh, he does say, though, to have a nice little bright side of this whole thing is that he has a back garden um, and it has a nice microclimate. On a sunny day, it will easily reach into the mid-30s, low 40s of Celsius, which is, you know, you're talking like the 90s and the 100s of Fahrenheit. Uh, the allotment, which he also has, is 44 by 80 feet and has a warm microclimate. It's sheltered on all sides and it can get quite hot and also has a lot of protection from prevailing winds. He has two polytunnels. One that's small, it's 10 by 12, and that's in his back garden. And then he also has a large one that's 24 by 60 feet, which is being built on his allotment this week. In the small polytunnel, I have literally just planted, he says, black Madeira in ground on the one side. This is surrounded by my potted trees. I reckon I could get another in ground on the other side. Um, I will have a fair bit of room with the 24 by 60 polytunnel. The center height he thinks is going to be 10 feet. So if the thing is 24 feet wide and the center is only 10 feet, where exactly, Carl, maybe, I guess you should have sent me a picture of the polytunnel, but um, where exactly, how does the height work out at different sections of the polytunnel, the different sections of that 24 feet? Um, we'll get into that in just a moment here, what I think is probably the best for you. Um, this is where he plans to put the orchard. Ideally, he wants to maximize the amount of room in there and get as many as uh, he can possibly fit. The remaining outdoor space on the allotment will be about 20 by 80 feet after the big polytunnel is built. Um, presuming uh, that he can grow most, he is, he's, hopefully, he's hopeful that he can grow most of the varieties in the polytunnel. Probably not the late ripening varieties. To what degree of ripeness, he doesn't know. Outdoors, Braba only probably, but I would love to get main crop to ripen. Oh, they, they would have to be super early and probably give uh, probably have to be in a really good location. He's right. So first off, I want to say here, Carl, uh, based off of this, is that the fact that you have a polytunnel, the fact that you have a nice microclimate, or you have multiple polytunnels, and you're getting to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that you can't ripen main crop and probably even some late varieties in the polytunnels. I would expect, if you're getting to 100, I don't know exactly at what time of the year this is happening for you, but in my greenhouse, it's uh, if it's like 70 degrees outside Fahrenheit, it's probably like 100 degrees in the greenhouse. Um, so I would expect, and that's usually, that can happen in like, you know, probably like May, um, yeah, so I think you have a really good shot personally of getting main crop off of a lot of these varieties because this polytunnel is going to, you're and the few things I'm going to tell you here in a minute, when we get down to that section on, on, um, the techniques and all that is that you're going to have no issue. We're going to, that polytunnel really extends your season. There's a couple other things we're going to do. You're going to have a much longer season. You're going to have enough heat. The, the sunlight is my biggest issue, but the sunlight really has not been the biggest thing. And if you're doing this correctly in terms of really making use of all the light possible in this greenhouse uh, by the techniques that we're going to talk about in a minute, you're going to be all right. Because the light is not really the biggest issue. It's really the heat. Um, so let's, let's continue on. Um, also, I do think that outdoors, Braba only is probably the best 
case scenario, but you should be able to get some main crop to ripen from the super early varieties. I, I wouldn't doubt that. And you're going to have to do a, a number of techniques to get this to really work. And I don't know exactly how many days you have in your climate in terms of frost free days or how long exactly your season is, but uh, it is extremely mild and I imagine it's pretty decently long. Um, well, you say it's short season, so let's just say it's going to be tough. I have no doubts in my mind, but I'll tell you which ones in just a minute here is going to do well potentially outside. And outside, it's all about warming that soil up quicker. Um, planting them in the great location, like you said, you know, putting them against the house or putting them in a, in a, just surrounded by tons of concrete and, and all kinds of things that have thermal mass, get the soil warmed up quicker and you're going to have much more success. So without a doubt, you need to invest in, um, some fabric, some black fabric, and you need to put that on the ground. Um, that stuff really does wonders. We just did a video recently. Maybe you saw it. We talked about uh, Big Bill's Orchard here in Pennsylvania. And Big Bill has like 90 or so trees in the ground in 6B. Um, and he's using that black fabric on the ground that really warms up the soil, particularly early in the season. That's the key. And that's what you also want to think about, by the way, when you're kind of facing these trees obviously you want to put them in an area that has as much sun as humanly possible you know so you you know you're going to want a southern exposure but also think about what if you have trees around you where those trees if they don't have any leaves on them as an example let's say in march in march they're not going to have leaves so the soil is going to warm up quicker in different areas better than it will in, let's say, June, right? The sun is on a different angle. There's no leaves on the trees. Um, think about the sunlight in terms of where it is in May or when the beginning of your season is because that's going to be the key. You want the maximum amount of sunlight in May and June and actually even um, April and maybe even March as well, you want from March onward, at least in my location, because our, our last frost is May 1st on average. So I want my trees to actually kind of wake up at the very latest May 1st. So I'm trying to think about locations in my yard that in, in March and April are already warming up the soil because the sunlight and that depending on the angle of the sun is really warming those up faster than other locations in my yard. And then that gradual increase in temperature in March and April then leads up to hopefully them waking up sometime around like mid April, early May. And because they wake up so early, that is really going to help you out. And you got that soil temperature that's really cooking at this point. That's going to give you the edge. Um, between do or die. It's all about that, the soil temperature. We talk so much about it. Um, so getting that black fabric down is like, it's just so important. That's like, I mean, the worst case scenario, you put down rocks and you only put down one layer of rocks. You don't want a thick, you don't want too thick of a layer, maybe some big boulders here and there. Um, you can even do lots of big boulders on top of the black fabric. Um, get yourself just some thermal mass. I mean, that is legitimately just look up, <clears throat> get a big barrel of water and just stick them randomly around your trees. I don't know how much you care about the appearances of all this stuff, but that's what it is right there. And then the, the second most important thing is the genetics. Um, so location, 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 but then genetics and I'm going to break this down here in two different categories for you. Uh, Carl was asking, by the way, for the viewers, what varieties would I recommend? Here's a list of what he has. They vary in terms of yada, yada, yada. He says, all my trees are very young, so I've yet to taste quite a lot of them. The ones I have put out the most figs so far have been Brown Turkey, Brunswick, Bornholm, Negron, 
et cetera, et cetera. I suppose I'm looking for something that's productive and tastes decent and that can ripen well enough in cooler summers. That said, I'm not fussy when it comes to varieties. I'll take what I can get. So I think you're not going to want to be too fussy with, I, I mean, I, when it comes to the in-ground outdoor trees, I think you're not going to want to be fussy when it comes to the variety. But in the greenhouse itself, I think you are going to, or in the polytunnels, I think you are going to want to be a bit fussy with that. And I'll tell you straight up right now is that I'm trying to figure this out myself <laughs> because I've only been growing fig trees now in my greenhouse for a very short time. I have friends that are doing this and they have really good success to limited success. Some are so vigorous that they reach the top of his greenhouse every year and he, it's always an issue for him. Um, others, it just becomes very difficult as well when I don't have many friends who are then selling the fruits. And commercial ability is really important, you know. Um, so this is a whole nother thing that you didn't really even ask me about. Maybe you're thinking about it in the back of your mind, but I know that you just want to be realistic with this whole thing. But I think you should be thinking about it because I do believe that you are going to have good success with this, um, especially in the polytunnels. So I would consider in the polytunnels, like I said, something very strongly. Um, so let's go over the, the varieties now, and I'm going to mention them in two different categories here. Okay, so first will be the trees that I think you could maybe get away with in the ground in terms of either having a Breba or having a very early main crop. So these brown turkeys, if they are indeed an English brown turkey, they produce a really good Breba. Born home is an English brown turkey. So if this looks like this, then they're the same thing. Born home is not very different at all, um, unless you have the wrong born home. <laughs> That's possible. Brunswick, I wouldn't grow in any scenario ever. Of any, I wouldn't grow this fig. Forget about it. Desert King, um, for Breba, you could do that in the ground. Um, two timer, I believe this is brown turkey, Californian brown turkey. Don't quote me on that, but I because I know that. Lubera, these these bastards, man. They changed all the names of all their figs, and it's just made the whole thing confusing. But in fact, these varieties, like two timer, does already exist, and I think it's I think it's California brown turkey, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let's see, what else would I grow in the ground? Long to do, you could grow in the ground for an early main crop. Hardy Chicago for an early main crop. Ice crystal, I don't think this fig fruits or it takes a long time. The fruit quality just isn't there. It's kind of like a novelty plant. Uh, I'd get rid of it unless you want to keep, keep it as a novelty. Uh, Ronde Bardot, this is another one you could put in the ground outside for an early main crop. Brooklyn White, my friend Tony loves this fig and he thinks it's very early, but I don't really know many people growing it with as much success that he has. So. He's the only one, and I can't really say if this is one you should go with or not. Although I trust pretty much everything that man says. Uh, improved Celeste. Um, again, that's another really early main crop. Malta Black. Bicane, also another very early main crop. Uh, Rogue de Bordeaux. This is Pastelier, which is also very early. So those are the figs right there. I don't know what French Unknown is, and I don't know what the Nana Maria is. Maybe you can send me photos of those. Uh, if you've ripened them, send me the the uh, pictures of the figs cut open if you have it. And then I can tell you what they are. Um, and if that would work in the ground outside. But those are the figs that I just mentioned that would work in the ground outside. The next category are the figs that would work in the greenhouse um potentially for some decent commercial ability they taste good um they should be productive and they should ripen in the polytunnel um in terms of the commercial ability that's a big question as i've mentioned in fact all of these figs like i said i'm trying myself to have figs that are grown outside like you to see which one of those are the very early varieties will then 
also have commercial ability because it's not just enough to for them to be early right they have to be able to sell they have to look nice people have to enjoy them um so there's that whole category which i don't really know in fact i don't think anybody knows um then you have figs that are grown commercially in warmer climates that is well known that they do well commercially so these are the figs that you kind of have to think about in your polytunnel that's the kind of category that you want is something that would do well in this and this information for the most part is mostly available not with all of these of course but for most of them actually i think ron de bordeaux is being sold commercially in um in africa i think they're growing this fig in the masses in africa um okay so in the in the polytunnel brown turkey if it is an english brown turkey that could be potentially a decent commercial fig it's got some nice size to it um it also doesn't have the worst color also the two timer if that is indeed californian brown turkey that is i mean that's what everyone sells right i mean that's what most people sell additionally they sell um panache so that's definitely one you should strongly consider um negron and neuro 600m they're both violette de bordeaux types and i have a strong hunch they actually would do well in a commercial setting but they probably won't hold up to manipulation or to just people touching them or the handling of them they're going to kind of eventually kind of fall apart you know and um spoil so uh, i would say those are worth a shot but probably not on the top of my list they're also like a mid-sized fig uh black madeira this is one that i'm sort of trialing here in my greenhouse not black madeira but something similar it's called colonel Littman's black cross and we'll see how that one does but mainly that one's from my own personal consumption is that i want to eat as many of those as i could um but i have a feeling that one can do really well it's got a thick skin it's got a hard skin um it's got great size the flavor is incredible so uh i would say that one should have a good shot of doing well that's assuming you can control the humidity in your green in your polytunnels um long to do actually could be something potentially that would do well i don't think the skin is really all that great on it for commercial ability um so that one may be not something you want but it is a larger size fig strawberry verte is kind of like panache in, in a lot of ways um so that one could potentially do well as well maybe even ron de bardot because people are growing that already commercially sucret um let me see what Bode says about Sucret. Um, I don't think this one's going to be have, have really much commercial ability. Yeah, it's not really. Um, yeah, it's it's really doesn't look good. You know what I mean? Like it gets these spottings on it very easily so visually it's not a great fig even if it had the thick skin that you're looking for i think brooklyn white has quite a thick skin golden riverside could be worth it as well i think the skin on that one's probably quite thick and believe it or not it um it's huge i mean peter's honey this is dotado so this is definitely a really well and highly regarded commercial fig that was grown throughout italy for I think like a thousand years or something crazy. Um, let's see what else. Sultane, this is a commercial fig in France. Uh, Pastelier here. I have a friend in Italy that sells this one commercially. Um, however, it really depends on how you're handling these. You know, you really got to be careful with them. You know, you got to have the optimal storage conditions when you pick them and. Yeah, you, know, you got to be doing all the right things here. Uh, Dalmati, again, this is another one that could do really well commercially. Verdone, this one could also do well commercially. And then, of course, Panache, as we already mentioned. So I'm going to say that, um, you know, that's your list right there of things to try. 
in terms of they're going to taste good. They're probably going to ripen in your climate on that polytunnel. I have a, I have a feeling every fig on this list will ripen for you. What I would suggest in terms of your harvest is that you may want maybe even three different varieties in the polytunnel. Um, you may want something that's early, mid-season, and late. and um, Or maybe even just two varieties for something early and something late or somewhere in the middle of that. Um, you're not going to really want to grow bra anything for Brabas in there. Um, the height is going to be sort of an issue and the vigor is going to be an issue. So that's something you're going to have to really tweak and pay attention to. And this is not something that I can really tell you because you're going to have to learn this for yourself. You're going to have to really pay attention to your trees, evaluate them well, and be able to come up with the right techniques. And I can tell you what you know some of those techniques are, but you're going to have to really use your intuition to evaluate these trees and figure out different ways to keep them a bit smaller and less vigorous. Um, we'll get into that in just a minute here. But I would say that probably if I had to just choose two of them on this list, and then that was it, and they can only be at 10, 10 feet tall, so I've already chosen panache in my greenhouse, but the issue here is that a, you know it's very difficult to beat a caprified panache grown in California. If you don't have the caprification on this, it's not going to taste as good. However, it still is a really good fig for commercial potential. So I would consider, and the other issue here is like, what else, what do your customers want? Do they want berry figs? Do they want honey figs? So you may want to have, you know, one honey fig in the terms of Dotado or in terms of Golden Riverside. And then you may want to have like something really late, like Black Madeira. Um that doesn't grow very quickly um, because it puts out so many figs that it kind of gets slowed down a bit. Um, that's also a berry fig that's, like I said, late in the season. I would strongly consider Black Madeira. There's other figs out there, by the way, that you may want to consider. Um, I think Sultane is worth considering as well for another berry fig, but that's mid season. And then you may also want to consider brown turkey, right? That's another mid season fig. Um, man, it's really tough to say, to be honest with you. And, and again, I'm still kind of sifting through all this myself to really come to some sort of conclusion. But think about this in terms of your harvest, right? You know, get something that's late, get something that's early, get something that's berry, and get something that's honey. Grow these out for a number of years. Have these people try them, and then come back and maybe make some iterations. You can even do some grafting um, potentially down the road. So it's not like you have to rip things out and start over from new. Um, there's always a way around this. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm going to go with here. And I'm, maybe the the overall top choice is probably Panache out of all the figs on that list. Um, can you imagine people seeing a striped fig in their grocery stores in Ireland? That'd be pretty, be pretty cool. I, they probably don't even know what the heck what it is, though. You know, they're not going to have any idea. I don't know how many people eat figs in Ireland or even know what a fig is, but that'd be pretty cool to see a panache there. Another fig you should consider is like a Col de Dom. Um, I would, I would personally have to grow a Col de Dom. Um, also something like Brojoto Nero, um, Borges Sot Noir. Um, they're all very similar figs by different names. Borges Sot Negra. You know, they're very different. They're very slightly different strains of the same fig. 
Um, that is a really good commercial fig. So I would strongly consider getting one of those two or both of them. Um, I think brown turkey or um, brown turkey obviously has high commercial potential, but it tastes like crap, you know, in my personal opinion. And if it's not caprified, it tastes even worse. And black Madeira seems like it would be awesome, but I feel like there could be some things that go wrong. And a lot of this again really depends on the conditions. That, in all honesty, I could say, all right, well these would do well and these wouldn't do well but i'm not there physically at your location and you just won't know until you try um everything is everything every place is different every microclimate is different so again i would just you know it's i it's a shame but to be honest with you i i think i did give you some pretty good um tips here look for things that have thicker skin that don't um, split that don't ha get too much cracking in them that don't um, you know that really hold up to when you touch them they don't kind of fall apart in your hand um, all right so let's move on I think Carl you really got the uh, the idea there so the growing methods now um, this is pretty simple I, I think it's really um, I know you say here, okay, I'll read it out. This is one he's really stuck on, spacing rows, tree shape, espalier, et etc. I really don't know which way to go about this. Should I do a potted orchard, which he's reluctant to, he, he's gonna explain later, or plant in the ground, which is more productive. If I plant in the ground, what way should I shape the trees? How should I space them? Likewise for potted trees, I would prefer to plant in the ground. I had been reading about Japanese espaliers recently and have been considering this method because I reckon I could cover it with row covers in early spring, bring my trees out of dormancy a bit earlier without having to heat the polytunnel. However, I wouldn't know what spacing would be adequate or even what variety would be suitable. Uh, would it take up too much room? So I would, I would um, to go back to another point that I made, I would consider doing potted trees um, outside of the, of the polytunnels and I know that you're gonna have great success in the ground um, with things that produce Braba and potentially also really early main crop especially because these trees are not dying every year especially also if you don't prune them at all if you prune them very lightly you're gonna have earlier figs if they survive the winter you're gonna have earlier figs if you heat up the ground you're gonna have earlier figs so um, I would say in ground's the way to go, but if you have some extra room, grow some potted trees, potted figs on the patio, or again, in another area with a lot of heat, a lot of thermal mass, and see how well those do. You know, do a nice little comparison between them. Um, you should be able to get though, however, very close ripening times versus in ground versus in in pots and because only because you're growing them in the ground and they're not dying now because of where i live they die every year in the ground they're so much further behind than my potted trees um by about a month so it's um your climate's totally different and i would just recommend putting as many of them in the ground as i could um, you're going to have a higher yield. It's going to be less work. Um, and it probably in the end won't ripen really that much earlier than an in-ground tree, as a, you know, a potted tree as an example. Um, but it may be worth it to maybe get an extra two weeks. You know, that's what you could be looking at is probably two weeks and that would be it. But again, there's a bunch of different things you have to go through with the pots, you know. Um, and if you screw up with the pots, you may actually not get them two weeks earlier like you thought. So again, excuse me, there's a lot to this. And I would just recommend growing them. Um, that's pretty much what I'm transitioning to almost completely. Because if I can get them in the ground at the same time, pretty much the same time as I'm getting them in pots, why do I have them in pots? The only reason I have trees in pots and will in the future have them in pots is to then put them in the greenhouse to get them a really early head start so that they can ripen well before anything else. 
But even a tree in the greenhouse is going to ripen relatively at the same time as a potted tree in the greenhouse, you know? Um, so I don't see too much benefit of growing things in pots for you, but it could be worth just trying it. Um, okay, so the growing methods you're going to use in the ground are quite simple. Outdoors, like I said, we're, you're not pruning them. Very light pruning. Um, you're going to shape them well. And I think you should grow it as a single stemmed tree. Grow them as a tree. Um, take out all the suckers from the base every year um, and get the nice shape to it, a nice big canopy to it that's not too dense, that does let, let in some air, or let in some um, some sunlight, but also isn't too, uh, too bare either. You need to find that right happy medium that's going to get you the right amount of sunlight and that sunlight really helps with them fruiting believe it or not so if you have too dense of a canopy things can be a bit tricky especially in your climate okay um so that's in ground now in the uh the polytunnels here you need to grow them as japanese espaliers this is like the only way to do it and you're going to come back to those um, those cordons every year. For those of us who don't know what the Japanese espalier is, is that we have pretty much a main trunk that comes up about a foot and then at that point you top it and you let it grow out two branches. And I think the ideal length for these branches in your your small poly polytunnel, like you said, it's 10 foot by 12 foot which makes me think, all right, is that, um, is that 12 foot long or 10 foot long? If it's 12 foot long, you could probably space them out five feet apart, which means each cordon is gonna be two and a half feet long. They grow up straight. Then you bend them down along the wire and train them horizontally. Uh, then they pretty much form these spurs and you keep coming back to these spurs every year these system, systems of branches, I should say. And from these locations, they then put out these long shoots here, as you can see right in here. So here's the nice little spur that gets cut back every year, and then it comes up, and it's contained. You can see how orderly this is and how organized this whole thing looks. This is even a little bit less organized than you would probably want in your particular situation because you have not as much light um, sunlight hours but also you um, you're trying to keep these trees a bit smaller right so you really need to contain them you really need to make sure that you're on top of exactly what your tree can handle and what it can't and making sure it gets the right amount of nitrogen if it gets too much nitrogen, you know, you could have a tree that just gets out of control. Um, you know, that's very possible. You could also have too much nitrogen and these guys won't fruit. Um, so it's <laughs> it's a bit tricky here. And again, you're going to be the have to be the person that comes in here and make sure that you're really using your intuition on this whole thing. But see these all these this many branches here. It's just too many. <laughs> You know, you're going to want to space them out with a, with a stake or with a wire system like this. Um, and you're going to want to space them out pretty well. I would say this actually looks pretty decent. And let me s see if I can find another photo here for you. Here we go. So again, this is kind of another way of looking at it is that they come up and then they're trained up wires or string or poles and these are spaced pretty decently but I would say the the closest spacing you may want to consider is probably um, eight inches apart and I think that's the absolute closest I wouldn't even probably do that I would try for the first um, the first couple years I would I would space them out 12 feet a foot I'm sorry, 12 foot, or uh, <laughs> one foot apart. So um, 
yeah, so space out each individual new shoot that comes out a foot apart, thin out the rest, and only keep these. You may find that because there's only so there's less there's less shoots that you may have an issue where those fewer shoots are more vigorous. But you want fewer shoots anyway because you live in a you don't have enough sunlight or I should say you have less sunlight. Um, you also have um, a, a shorter season. So having less shoots is going to mean thicker, stronger shoots that are longer, more vigorous. Um, and you're just going to want to play around with that. You're going to want to play around with the amount of these shoots and you're going to want to play around with the spacing of these shoots. Giving them the right spacing is going to make all the difference in your success. Another thing here, which I think is really worth noting, and I didn't really even think about this, um, but they're doing it right here. I mean, they got the black plastic on the ground. They're warming up the soil. You talked about row cover. So you have a you know some kind of covering over top of the thing. Anything on the ground and warm this whole thing up. Create yourself a situation where this is all waking up sooner. I recommend it. Again, it's all about the soil temperatures. Um, additionally, he's got something here that looks like they've girdled some of these branches. Or at least stopped in a way the, the flow of sap in these branches. And it looks like though what they had done is they took string and they wrapped the string around the branch and that's kind of how they got it up straight in the air and then once they got it up straight in the air they maybe took that string off or did something different i don't know but this string here either that string or that's wire or they actually girdled the tree and they kind of ringed it around in a very strange fashion. It doesn't look too uniform to me. So what this is telling me, and I personally would do this anyway, regardless if they're doing it or not, is that you're going to want to mess with girdling. Um, and this is going to slow the sap flow. If you have too much sap flow, they're going to grow and grow and grow and they're not going to fruit. Because you're doing a hard pruning every year and coming back to this main structure, too much pruning leads to the next year having too much growth. So it's really important to be careful with your nitrogen, be careful with the the um, the sap flow, and if you need to girdle or if you need to score the bark, let these let these trees bleed a little bit. They're going to slow down. They're not going to get too out of control. They're going to recover. It's not going to kill the tree, but get yourself a knife and experiment with that that's something that i'm definitely going to be doing next year on all the trees that are in the ground um, on the property here even the trees in the pots that um that just grow too quickly in the spring when they grow too quickly they don't fruit well it's just it's just a fact um so that's something you're going to want to work on and experiment with um, okay, so they got the black plastic. We got the Japanese espalier. These things can get rather large. I mean, that's it's just the facts, right? So we're going to have to make sure, like I said, space them out the right distance. Select the right number of shoots. You can see this tree here probably is only about 10 feet away. Um, you know, this cord in here is probably 5 feet long. And then the next cord in here is probably five feet long, um, maybe even less than that. You know, maybe these trees are spaced six feet apart. And that's kind of what your other question was here, is that how close should you space them? And personally, I would go a very minimum, the absolute minimum, five feet apart. That means you have the cordons, again, that are two and a half feet long, two and a half feet long. You lie them down. That's five feet. Um, I think ideally it's like 10 feet or even 12 feet. And to be honest with you, uh, it doesn't seem to, I haven't really figured out just yet if there's a sweet spot there, if a longer cordon is better or worse 
than a shorter cordon. I don't know. Um, it sounds like to me that keeping them a bit smaller, having less cordons or a shorter cordon may help with keeping the tree a smaller height as well because the tree then in itself is, is smaller. Um, there's less permanent structure there. So potentially that could help you with the height. I'm not entirely sure. Spacing in between the rows, this is something that is also going to be a bit experimental, but I would say a minimum of eight feet apart. Um, you're going to want a lot of room in there to work. And if you go back to these, these photos here, this can really become a mess. Um, you can see this is a pretty nice distance here. Enough for you to walk, enough for you to work, enough for you to set up these stakes, enough for you to, to uh, attach these new branches to the stakes if you wanted to do it like that. Um, and then also enough room for these trees to get light. Um, so I think that's really important. It's not just the distance between each of the new shoots that come up, but also the distance between the trees to allow each canopy to get enough light. Um, what you're going to want to do though, however, maybe you could get away with six feet, but you're going to want to pretty much keep these, these new branches pretty much straight up in the air. I would imagine the cordon itself or the Japanese espalier, the permanent, yeah, the cordons, I guess, will probably be about a foot and a half to two feet wide. And then you've got, let's say two feet wide, then you've got three feet of the new shoots um, that go up. And I think that's reasonable. If you space one side of the tree and the other side of the tree and they're three feet apart, I think that's really good for the, the canopy of the tree, for production, for maximizing your space. Then you've got a total of three feet then there's another three feet on the next tree and in between those three feet and the other three feet is you. So you need to have um, at least two to three feet in there so that you can walk and operate. So I would say, um, yeah, eight feet sounds about right. You know, um, but also that even sounds like six as well, because if you did six, that's a foot and a half plus three feet plus another foot and a half, that's six feet. So you could do about six feet, I would imagine. Now here's where it gets a little tricky though in your greenhouse, because you have, um, and this is something I think you should think about quite a bit, is that you have this larger polytunnel. The smaller one, I think you could fit the second tree in there. Um, the one that's 10 foot by 12, as we just discussed, I think it I think it would work. And the large one that's 24 by 60, I think it's 24 feet wide, right? And then also um, 10 feet tall, but that that is creating some issues. So what you can do in the middle of the greenhouse is have yourself two rows. So if you got 24 feet total. We space them six feet apart, let's say. You could have probably three rows in there. And that would give you 18, um, that would give you 18 feet. But your issue then becomes the sides. As you go further out, as most people know, it's a it's a hoop. So at the middle of the polytunnel, it's the tallest. And as you go out, it gets shorter and shorter until it reaches the ground. So the other option here, either you do three rows, exactly how I just mentioned, really try to control the height of it. Or what you can do is come in here and do four rows. And you do two rows in the middle and then on the rows on the end, you have just one side of the cordon um, fruiting and growing. So as an example here, um, we'll go back to this photo down here, is that let's just say for argument's sake, on the left side of the, of the tree here, we're gonna completely eliminate that. 
We're not going to let anything grow on the left side. We're only going to let the stuff grow on the right side. And that's going to essentially get you the same amount of, uh, of production, though. So if you think about it, you have three rows. Um, each tree has two different sides to it. So that means you've got six different sides producing. But if you did four rows with two trees when each side producing, that's four uh, four sides of the trees producing. Plus on the very ends, you have two, tr two rows and only one side of that is producing for a total of six. So it kind of all works out to be the same amount of trees, except you have more rows and one side of the row or one side of the trees are just not producing on both sides. So um, I think it just makes more sense for you to have three rows. Um, because if you have four rows, then you have to have space in between each row for you to walk. And that adds up. So I think uh, you can figure this out mathematically without a doubt. But I think that's how I would do it, is do three rows, try to cram them all in there as much as I could. And maybe what I do is on, let's say if this side here on the left side of this tree is, for example, has uh, the, the low side of the polytunnel, and we don't want this side of the tree to get too tall, maybe we just have more branches we space them a bit closer more branches means less vigorous shoots less thick shoots we'll probably get a little bit of a later fruit set that way you know playing around with these these spacing here and the numbers of branches the number of fruiting branches is really going to make this whole thing kind of work out for you so that's why i'm saying intuition trying to get the right amount of fruiting branches per tree to get you the right fruit set to get you the right height of these trees. Now, and at the end of the year, if you have to prune them, if they're reaching the top too much, then you could just prune them. You know, it's not like it's the end of the world. There's ways of stopping these trees from growing. Just cut them off at the top. You know, you lose some sap at the top. It's not the end of the world. You know, you're just trying to get the production you want out of these long shoots and then stop the production. You know? Okay. Um, what other techniques and growing methods can I share with you? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much all about getting them uh, a warmer soil, waking them up sooner. Having the right varieties, the right genetics. We can do some girdling to slow the sap flow. Uh, thinning out the branches, selecting the right branches we want, staking those branches, spacing the branches at the appropriate spacing. Fruiting branches I'm talking about. And uh, that's pretty much all it is. There's nothing else to it. Finding the right amount of nitrogen to feed your trees, the right amount of food. Um, we probably don't want to be pinching in this scenario. We probably don't have to. Um, in fact, it may be a bit counterproductive in this particular scenario. Um, you could pinch a number of the branches and then leave the rest of them. Okay. Now, number four here, problem so far. All right, this one's all about spider mites in the problem section. I've been battling spider mites for the last two years and have really devastated my trees. Last year, about this time, my trees stopped growing and the leaves turned yellow and eventually dropped off along with their fruit. Right now, the same thing has started happening again. 
About 80% of my trees have stopped growing. Any new leaves that begin to form just fall off. Some have started to drop their fruit and some have started yellowing um, of their leaves or both. Last year, I thought this was a nutrient issue, fed micronutrients, with soluble feed, did nothing. Preempting this at the beginning of the season, I fed regularly with a soluble feed and once a month with micronutrient. However, it did nothing. It was only about two weeks ago that I discovered the mites and they're everywhere. Don't ask me how I didn't spot them before. Presuming that the spider mites were also the issue last year. So because of this, I'm a little reluctant to go to the potted orchard as I suspect my in-grounds may be able to cope with the infestation a bit better. I think that's a fair assessment. My in-ground RDB by comparison is the picture of health. That plus the fact that I'm not entirely sure spider mites were the sole culprits of the carnage. Maybe I could have used a better soil mix, feed schedule, different nutrients, etc. I did consider pre-spider mite discovery that maybe it's a climatic issue. We don't really get that much heat over here, hence the polytunnel. I thought the lack of vigor on some of my trees was due to a lack of heat, but that couldn't be possible as I found a number of 20 to 30 foot local trees that look extremely healthy. Um, okay. So this is pretty simple. Um, spider mites are pretty easy to get rid of, but once they get out of control, they really become an issue. Um, now, what you need to know about spider mites is that they can very much so affect fig trees. And this is one of the bigger pests. This one in scale, I think, is probably the two that you really have to worry about. Um, they really like, the spider mites really like a dry, hot environment. So if you have them in the, in the polytunnel, in a drier environment, and of course it's warm in there, as you said, it's 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, during the day, then that's creating the perfect environment for the spider mites. Um, I think this is a situation that you just have to take care of from the beginning. This can certainly affect the growth of the trees, um, certainly stop them from growing And this has got this is definitely something that's more affected by potted trees. The potted trees really just sit in pots for too long. They're stressed out more, especially if you got them from somewhere and they weren't really that healthy to begin with. And you know, it just kind of perpetuates the cycle. And the longer I've had trees in the ground here, the less pests I've seen. The less stressed out my trees are. Um, everything just performs so much better every single year. And it's the same thing with potted trees as well, is that in the beginning they seem to be struggle a bit and it takes a year or two for them really to get out of that mess. Um, if they really have been just stressed out for, for a while or even from the beginning. So it's really important, I think, to just realize that, you know, this is just something that happens in the first couple years potentially. Um, but if you're getting spider mites really badly, you need to get rid of that. You need to be on top of that. Um, and there's a lot of products you can use. Um, I don't really have the perfect spider mite solution. I'm gonna be honest with you. I've only dealt with it on my citrus trees and it's actually in the closet to my left because the grow closet to my left is really dry and really hot and that's what really brings on the spider mites and they seem to really only affect certain things more than others so I guess what you could do is put something in there that it maybe is more affected like citrus um, you know put some kind of trap in there some kind of lure or just completely eradicate the entire problem this is something you definitely have to deal with um, I wish you had told me the humidity in your greenhouse, by the way, because that's something you want to make sure you get down, is that you want a low humidity. And unfortunately, that's something you have to deal with, but with these spider mites, but that's something you really want when growing figs, is low humidity. That's the whole point of having covering, of having plastic. Um, yeah, it gives a lot of heat, but... Um, that humidity really makes a difference having a low humidity in terms of the quality of the fruit 
um, in terms of you having spoilage issues or ferment fermentation issues, um, it's a big deal. Um, all right, so there's other reasons though your trees could stop growing. And one of them could be that it's just too hot. If the root temperatures of these plants, the figs, get over 90, uh, specifically really 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, I think is really the magic number there. Um, take the temperature of the soil. If that's the case, they just won't grow over 95. Um, it could be that they're heat stressed. It could be that they're maybe not getting watered enough. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think it has anything to do with the, the nutrients. Although having the right nutrients is really going to help them grow well. If you're using an inorganic soluble fertilizer, that should be enough to really get them out of any sort of issue in terms of not growing because of not enough food. That should be plenty of food. Um, so if it's too hot, you got to cool the, the temperatures down in the, in the soil. Put some mulch on them. Um, the potting mix that you're using could also be a factor here. Um, but it's very unlikely, you know, I, I obviously you need, you need something well draining, something that has good compost in it. That's broken down. Well, if it's not broken down, well compost, it's not going to unfortunately, um, give the nutrients that you're, you're hoping for until that compost really breaks down. If you have really large pieces in your soil, that's not good. Um, in terms of it being a climatic issue, I think that's pretty much just that it's just too hot, right? Could be too hot in those polytunnels. And then you said though, we really don't get that much heat over here, hence the polytunnel. Um, the lack of vigor on some of your trees was due to a lack of heat. That's for certain. If you don't have enough heat, they're not going to grow. If the soil temperatures are not 70 degrees or higher, they're not going to grow. If they're 95 degrees, they're going to stop growing. However, if you have spider mites crazy like that, um, yeah, they're, they're going to stop growing. So I don't know. It's tough for me to say I would need to see, oh wait, I forgot about the photos. Right. So here's, um, one of the gardens or the allotment here. I can't remember which one this is. Yeah, this would have helped. <laughs> this would have helped <laughs> five minutes ago. Um, these look healthy to me. They have mulch on them. They don't have black pots. You should always have black pots where you live. Forget this orange stuff. It's black or nothing. Um... I'm assuming this is the 10 by 12 polytunnel here. The soil looks pretty good in there. Looks like there's a lot of organic material in there. That might be something you don't want. You probably want less organic material in the soil as time goes on because these trees will just grow too much. In fact, you may to control their height, you may just want less organic material. This leaf right here is a sign of uh, your trees growing in high humidity or this leaf formed in an environment with high humidity and then now it's low humidity and it looks like it's just struggling to adjust to the low humidity. This doesn't, I guess it sort of does look like spider mites there. This looks like it could be scale, unless that's a bud. I can't tell.
FMV, this is just a symptom of your tree just not getting enough nutrients and or being kind of a bit immature. Being a little stressed out. In time, this should go away on all the trees. Now, is this spider mite damage? It's good that you're training most of these figs as single stem plants. They're the ones that are in pots. This looks like brown turkey. Now, I've seen these little long strands like this before. And I guess that is spider mite damage. Oh, that's a really good <laughs> on fiddly fig. That was the yeah. That's what I normally see as spider mites. That's what I normally see right there. Well, I mean, I don't want to question you if you think you've accurately identified them as spider mites. What you should do, and when these trees are dormant, is really spray them with some kind of dormant oil or a horticultural oil. Smother these things, get rid of them. And then inevitably only grow figs in this in your greenhouse. I would not have I know we talked about having a lure or a trap or maybe something to put them to attract their attention elsewhere. But if you've got this situation cleared up, don't put anything else in there that could attract these things. Yeah, I mean that's not this is not really what I'm seeing on your trees so I'm very uh, I'm a little confused I guess that is a little bit of spider mite damage there why does this look like something else I've seen though what does this look like All right, well, Carl, I think that's mostly it of what I wanted to, or what you asked me, and I think we covered it pretty well here. If you have any more questions, let me know. I hope I answered that. I hope I cleared this whole thing up for you, buddy. Um, Again, I, I mean, the, the definitely the spider mites is something that you don't want to have to deal with on a regular basis. That's for sure. So clear that up. Look up. Certainly find some kind of solution that we would think would be the best for your situation. I'm pretty sure dormant oil works really well. You need to do something about it now. Um, maybe get yourself a miticide. Uh, I think neem works. It should work anyway. Um, yeah, I think horticultural oil will work really well. Yeah, let me look at this. Spider mites right here. All stages that winter on plants are readily killed by dormant applications of oil. So horticultural oil is basically oil. And I 
sprayed my trees with it last year to help get rid of scale and the numbers are significantly decreased this year and almost non-existent so you can even use horticultural oil believe it or not now and I think you have to look up um, specifics on it this is the product I use right here Monterey horticultural oil make sure you read the label on these things because they may tell you specifics on when and when you should not be spraying this but this will work really well mites right here um, also think about the humidity maybe it's too hot maybe it's too the humidity is too low that may be something you can just maybe temporarily help the situation with increase the humidity a bit in there for maybe this year and then next year when you're really producing those fruits um, lower the humidity back down and when you've already cleared up the spiritomite issue lower it back down alrighty so again I want to thank everybody here for watching I want to thank Carl for um, helping me out here and supporting my work and also allowing all of you guys to be able to receive the same advice so thanks to Carl again if everyone's in, if anyone's interested in checking this out you want to do you want me to do some consulting work for you check us out on figboss.com go to the consulting page and just send us a little contact um, definitely need a lot of information from you guys um, it's definitely a big help that Carl put this whole thing together, put together pictures, more pictures, the better. Um, yeah, it just really helps. So, all right, everyone, take care, and we will see you all soon for tomorrow's video. Um, see you soon.